Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Chris. How are you? I'm I'm all right. Today we're here, but we're not covering a guru. We haven't got a, another more intelligent person to tell us what's what. It's just me and you, Mano, uh, Mano, a Mano, o Mano. Yeah, Mano, a Mano. Yeah, Mano, a Mano. Yeah, and and we're here, Matt. Uh, I'm I'm going to inform you, like Chris. What is it? What what you got to tell me that we we get periodic requests from people to like talk a bit more about our research or academic stuff, right? I think people need to be careful what they wish for <laughs> because the, like asking academics to talk about research is just an invitation to hell <laughs> so but but we did think that for the patrons we could do little condensed episodes where we talk about uh, our research research topics that we're interested in or research papers and and maybe things like how to assess research papers and the quality within and those kind of things but that would come out naturally in conversations but Basically, to key to uh, talk a bit more about our research interests and backgrounds and that kind of thing, and we're gonna hmm. pilot test it today with a topic that you can describe. Do we do we have a yeah. nice name for this though? We don't, but like you're good at generating names. <laughs> like, <laughs> and a, a name for this series of things um, yeah guru bites that's terrible <laughs> that, that is bad <laughs> that's bad <laughs> um let's ask the garometers uh, no. we're not garometers no that's terrible as well the, mm. uh, mm, um, anyway we, we mean, need to workshop it, it. we need to workshop it. They, people can the, tell us some suggestions right yeah that would that'd be good that's that's it throw the ball back in their court uh yeah it's because people have quite rightly said that our show mainly focuses on us kind of criticizing other people for their opinions and you know galaxy brain stuff and we don't really put out much of ourselves sort of out there so i think if know. people say that matt they haven't been paying that much attention because suddenly if you listen on occasion we do offer our opinions and yeah, things that, that we value true. They're just hidden. It's very hard to decipher what they are, but they're, you know, they're there floating under the surface like a big iceberg waiting to hit you. <laughs> if you, if you just that is true. Like most of the critic, like most of the criticisms of our podcast, totally unfair and unfounded. Yep, when you think about it, <laughs> <laughs> when you think about it, cool. So yeah, no, and you know, the truth is that I haven't asked you much about your research, um, and we don't. You, and vice versa so um it is kind of good to you know i got a i got an expert here i got a guy who knows a thing or two <laughs> yeah i am an expert i am that's right I, 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 according to a little known place called yeah i forget <laughs> i forget where i got my phd it's yeah it's an that's institution funny cause you, were just, somewhere. you were just showing me your, your doctorate your, the, with the emblem and everything just a moment ago you were very well, proud yeah yeah matt that's just i was just just setting the scene, just to prove. I know that you need verification of qualifications before you'll even let our guests speak. They have to show copies of their certificates, and 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 then you will begin to enter the room and talk to them. But um, right. so I, they, I just follow protocol. They need to be signed by a justice of the peace and all of that. Yeah, yeah that's true. No, no, I've cited it, and I can confirm that. Uh, yes, it's, that's right. That's it's, that it's is real. related to that. I thought uh, in preparation for the conversation, I would reread my a small section of my thesis when I was actually like being intelligent <laughs> back many years ago. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I still don't hit my thesis. That's a that's an achievement. Like, uh, oh, yeah, that's good. I'd be too afraid to look at mine. But um, yeah, yeah, so your thesis was on religion and ritual and that kind of thing. But give us in, in, a, in a nutshell, not a big nutshell, just, just a modestly sized nutshell, Chris, what, what, what was your thesis about? The title of my thesis, which I've just remembered today, was Individual Pains and Social Gains, The Personal and Social Consequences of Collective Dysphoric Rituals. Mm. And that 
so that's it in a nutshell. It's a very good title, Matt. It took me time and it condenses it, uh, what it's about. But it only makes sense, I suppose, if you know what collective dysphoric rituals are. And those might be slightly psychology jargony terms, not so, collective. So Everyone knows collective. <laughs> so dysphoric is stuff that is unpleasant, right? Um, doesn't Correct. feel good. You're and a psychologist. <laughs> yes, that's right. So that makes me think of things like, I don't know, maybe like in a Masonic, okay, I'm just spitballing here. Is it like at a Masonic temple, for instance, you know, where they, they have these weird ceremonies that are, I don't know, they get their bottom spanked or something. I, I, I don't know. I've, I've Indeed, that's that. bottom spanking was the primary focus of this <laughs> dissertation. No, but actually, yeah, not, not, not that far off base. I did uh, three, three kind of empirical studies as part of the thesis there were originally six i was just being optimistic that i was going to fit those in but in any case i did one which is on a survey of brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners uh, they have this kind of thing which they do at greeting ceremonies some groups where they whip each other on the back with their belts and the people are often not wearing their their gi top uh, so the they get like very badly bruised and welts on the back and it's kind of like you know part of the promotion ceremony um so i was interested in whether that had psychological effects on how you see the group and uh how connected you feel with the other people because some groups do it and some groups don't that was the interesting mm. thing then mm. uh the second st study or set of studies was getting people to do artificial rituals small uh small rituals that we had invented in laboratories in Oxford and in Hokkaido in Japan, we would get mm. like groups of three people and tell them a cover story that uh, psychologists and anthropologists in Oxford were working together um, and that they had found these kind of instructions for old rituals. And one of the ways that people explore what rituals do, this isn't necessarily true, but we, we told them that, uh, anthropologists get people to perform the ritual instructions and then we try to see what people think that the rituals might have been about and you know academics look at uh what was involved um so this was the reason that we told people to come in and do uh like a follow this set of ritual instructions together and perform a ritual but actually what we were doing was that we were modifying the environment across a couple of conditions so uh the Manipulation was basically whether it was unpleasant, neutral, or unpleasant. And this was manipulated by whether the background uh, sound playing during it was screaming infant, kind of babbling generic infant, or like happy laughing infant, but laughing in a non-creepy way. That was an important thing to, <laughs> to, to calibrate. And, and then also uh, the room was either dark or well lit and the the little idol that they were doing the ritual with had an angry expression or a happy expression and so on. So you were varying whether or not it was dysphoric or not, right? That's to a certain extent, do. right? Like we, we couldn't make it. So just like, uh, yeah, environmental cues that were a bit more unsettling. It was yeah. very unpleasant to listen to a baby scream for like, it took 15 minutes, yeah. five minutes but, for each person to do it. So, But the but, ethics board wouldn't, wouldn't let you spank people, right? Uh, not in that study <laughs> yeah and, uh, so that was that was the like experimental one and then also in japan went out to a bunch of fire walking and uh and some cold water festivals but they're not actually in this thesis uh, so in the fire walking festivals we took people we, we gave surveys to people before and after a fire walking festival and and then we looked at you know, how they felt about the community and the fireworkers and so on. And also if they were more generous in a disguised donation game and this kind of thing, both the people who took part in the firewalking and the people who were in the crowd watching. Mm. So those were the three studies that were in. And that gives a, a general idea that, you know, the kind of area that I was interested in as my PhD. Yeah. I understand why you describe yourself more on that, like a psychological anthropologist, because that's that's all quite similar to stuff that a social psychologist would would do. Yes. So maybe the like the thing I think that would probably distinguish it is that we 
like field experiments are more common, right? Going out to festivals and that kind of thing. And also the, if you saw the lab experiment, you might be very upset because of <laughs> the, the, the ecological validity would just terrify you <laughs> because, you know, psychologists always want to strip things down and make like no potential influence from confounding variables. But in so doing, they make the situation incredibly artificial and we more emphasized on like making a thing which looks like a yeah. uh, real ritual. Yeah, yeah. So what was the takeaway from, so skip out all the intervening steps and skip yes. right to the sort of conclusion sort of section. What what was your main takeaway from, from doing that stuff? It's kind of messy, but I, like the basic idea was that, um, and this isn't, I don't think this is a, a grand insight, but that like painful or unpleasant experiences po post-event that are, subjectively interpreted as positive right so it doesn't matter you know how much you suffered at the time or that kind of thing it's the subjective reassessment of the experience that leads to the heightened group bonds that you feel towards other people and that this can be associated with like greater in-group generosity and so on behaviorally um but it doesn't always lead to that and it um is obviously stronger for the people that are participating in things and the people that are observing with them. So the other thing was like kind of looking at the existing relationships that people have and how committed they are. And these are significantly confounding. So, you know, it, it stands to reason, but you can't, I think in most cases, it would be hard to generate a deep commitment to a group purely from getting them to do a ritual event. Like it has to have yeah. the invested meaning in it. it yeah yeah like these things in the real world they happen within the context of a you know like a community generally of people that have been living together and working together for for, for their entire lives so i mean stepping back a little bit one thing that occurs to me is that one of the underlying assumptions from you know people like yourself and psychologists like me is that a lot of the things that people do in groups um are functional yeah, they, they serve some kind of purpose. It's not just mm -hmm. like a, it's not just random stuff that happens. But of course, the sort of null hypothesis is, is that, you know what I mean? Like some, some things are a bit random and just kind of arbitrary. Um, but I, I guess the underlying presumption of that theme of research is that the, the, the rituals that are uh, occurring, um, dysphoric or not, are are there for to serve a kind of whether it's social bonding or something like that some kind of purpose yeah? this might come dangerously close to the uh brett weinstein and heller haynes uh, <laughs> like what omega principle or whatever the case it may be but uh i think there's a much more legitimate version of what they posit which is and it applies in the case of dysphoric rituals which these are preserved culturally recurrent this is an important thing that there's essentially no society in which you don't find rituals and that you don't find dysphoric rituals and because they involve a uh, cost be it like physical pain discomfort or you know denote donating resources or whatever the case may be there is a question of why like why are people doing this and why is it being preserved if it serves no purpose and it can be there are there are bound to be occasions when you know it's it's preserved as a byproduct of something else which is being uh which has a functional purpose but i think there is enough evidence to show that dysphoric rituals especially collectively performed do seem to have functions in terms of bonding people together. And you find them often in uh, groups which are highly committed or engaged in like risky tasks, including like terrorist cells or military groups or, yep. you know, the, the, or cults, right? These groups which need to get high mm -hmm. commitment. And there's a, yep. uh, there's a theory by Joe Henrik, which focuses around rituals as creds credibility enhancing displays and that 
the argument is that, you know, taking part in rituals demonstrates a behavior to indicate that you hold a certain belief or you hold respect for a certain group. And if the mm-hmm. behavior is unpleasant, difficult, and so on, that this is a more convincing behavior than just like staying, yeah, yeah, I yeah. believe in whatever. Yeah, yeah. It made me think of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it makes me think of like costly signaling. Um, yeah, I have a section I mean, on it. <laughs> in the thesis. Oh, of course not, it's there. So, so the idea with that is that, you know, you can't just rock up to the Masonic temple and say, hey, I'd like to be a member. And they say, okay, here you go. Here's your badge. And they go, great. And then you stroll off. You need to sort of demonstrate your commitment by some sort of costly signal. Some, and, you know, this is where I could see where the dysphoria can kind of fit in, right? Because it's something something that's not easy. It's not necessarily pleasant. It's something that, that, that indicates that you care enough about this group to want to suffer a little bit in order to be a part of it. And there's a researcher called Aldo Simino who has kind of taken this perspective and applied it to an evolutionary framework. And he's argued that uh, initiation rituals specifically are a means of uh, weeding out free riders on groups, Mm. right? Because being a member of a group can give you elevated status, elevated access to resource. And that if you have people that, you know, ultimately don't contribute to the group, but just take that this is, a problem and would have been a problem evolutionarily for human groups. So being sensitive and developing like cultural tools that allow us uh, to, to discover uncooperative members is, is important. So his framework is interesting. I've, mm. I, I've actually talked with him and we have some uh, areas of like this agreement or that we, are unsure what the empirical evidence show because he's primarily focused on uh, initiation rituals. And a lot of the rituals that I'm talking about are not initiation rituals. They're rituals for people who are already members of the group. And so it's a slightly different dynamic, but yeah. But we actually plan to do studies together to look at some of that um, if Hmm. we ever get time. (laughs) Yes. Well, just a little side note, I'm going to put a pit in this because, but I'm just going to mention it just because it's in, well, I think it's interesting, is that um, back when I was doing my PhD, just, just I, I happened to read this paper where they'd, they'd played around with the iterated prisoner's dilemma. And for people who aren't familiar, the prisoner's dilemma is the sort of thing where you can cooperate, you can defect, um, and depending on what the two actors do, there'll be these differential payoffs. It's this, this classic little toy model for exploring these sorts of evolutionary cooperative or um, cheating defective type behaviors, which, which you just referred to. So the iterated prisoner's dilemma is one where you, you play that game not just once, but you do it multiple times and it gets much more interesting then. Um, so um, one of these days, Chris, I'll, I'll tell you about how when I, uh, I programmed up the iterated prisoner's dilemma with some very simple little DNA, like, you know, computer, DNA strands that govern mm. their behavior based on what the other player had had done and then they all there was a population of them they all played each other and so we had this population of of little um little agents um playing the game against each other and getting uh differentially selected into the next generation based on um their scores basically their, their accumulated scores so that was really fun and it was fun mm. to watch how the population evolved so one of these days we could talk about that but yeah to steer us back onto sorry well we had one there was just like one offshoot of that is that i didn't directly uh do this but i was involved on the paper where it's published um there there was some agent-based modeling i think it's agent-based modeling which attempted to look at ritual dynamics and like uh modeling costly rituals as you know rituals which minus fitness or like whatever the points be a system were but can potentially lead to uh i can't remember how they modeled it in but but in the paper it was it indicated that this was a you know a counterintuitive way of making uh communities of agents more successful in the long run than ones that didn't do yeah it. so it's not yeah, that, like the, the thing with modeling studies is always there's a lot that goes into the parameters that you yeah. build in your model. So if you're good at modeling, 
you can yeah. almost produce always evidence. get the answer you want. <laughs> yeah. no, I know, so, I know. but but I... it was interesting. So you can like do modeling with rituals as well, right? You can modeling with anything. You can. I mean, we're getting into a whole different topic now, but I've always been interested in that, and I completely agree with you that you you have. To, for a modeling study to be good, it almost has to be so simple that you do not have the flexibility to tune parameters, you know? And, um, but then when it's so simple, it's so abstract. Yeah. It can be quest questionable as to whether it's, it's, it's real, but. Ecological uh, I, validity. That's the yeah, important yeah. academic yeah, yeah. term here, Matt. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I like the iterated process one, though, regardless, I think, I think it's a good, I think it's a good model despite being like, I think that the, it captures the, a lot, captures a lot yeah. about like interactions, right. The, 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 like that things can be beneficial to you in the short term, but they will harm cooperation and, and rewards for everyone in the long term. That's a, that's a common situation. Yeah. And the iterated version, meaning that it depends on the way it's implemented, but that you can track reputations or, uh, potentially have a third party punishment element and stuff, mm -hmm. right? And these these do reveal interesting dynamics about yeah. human psychology. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's lots of like a lot of interesting places you go that that actually aren't connected to religion. And we're going to get back to religion in a second. But it, you just made me think of how, like, at, at our university, like a lot of organizations, I've noticed a tendency where they want new applicants, like job applicants, you know, or, or new members, um, employees to sort of do their time like they'll sort mm. of be denied promotion and whatever and they'll be given i think this is true across the board given a lot of not the worst jobs and so on and it's kind of like this thing where everyone's got to do that for a year or two or more to sort of and i think a lot of it's got to do with showing commitment and yeah once one, once you've done that then like you could even you could view writing a phd thesis in some extent as a hazing ritual right yeah. because like yeah. often because sure if people write it over five years and they spread it all out that's good you know that then it isn't but like the reality is many people condense the writing into a very short period of time and they suffer yeah. tremendously for that but then many people have had similar experiences and you know if you talk to them you'll feel yeah you know i went through something similar and it you feel more connected so yeah i it extends that the definition a bit but but i think there are these like i think there is something fundamental about having experienced something difficult and and potentially personally traumatic that you regard as like core to your biography this is one of the like uh, an yeah. irrelevant thing can make you feel very attached to other people that have a similar thing, which is core to them. And, you know, this is why I have a lot of sympathy for people talking about the IDW and going through a, what they regard as like a public trauma, right. As being part of the initiation into their group. It's, it makes perfect sense to me uh, in terms of like ritualized dynamics and psychology that they, they would feel that and that that would work, right. Mm -hmm. If you, and it, it works as a costly signal as well, like from their perspective, because you, you know, in their world, mm. being heterodox is a very costly, dangerous, brief thing to do. So when you think about it, like entering into any kind of relationship or, you know, and a, entering a group is, is like entering into a relationship. Yeah. You, if it's, if it's a, like a deep and committed one, what you're being expected to do is to kind of recreate yourself in a way. In, in in order to be this sort of functioning group member so i could see that the what you described as you know like a personally you know, whatever existentially significant kind of thing is yes can be important as as a signifier that you've actually honestly undertaken to make that kind of it's almost like a sacrifice a little bit of a sacrifice of self and, and like with hazing rituals and so on, it's like a sacrifice of dignity, you know. Yeah. Um, it, in order to, yeah, to to sort of join the group. So yeah, you can see. I mean, like I, I'll I'll get off the hazing ritual thing, but like even the Nixium cult, right? Recently, they part of the thing that people really disliked about them were that they they had this concept. I think it was they. I can't remember how they termed it, but it was like you had to give collateral 
to the group, which was like secrets, right? Or, you know, or nude photos or, or something, or, you know, branding is the most obvious, like physical demonstration of commitment, but like, but even telling people, you know, things that could damage your reputation, like you've had an affair or something like, like that, this, these are all ways of demonstrating your commitment to the group, but then they function as a way that you can be controlled, right? And Scientology has done it as well. But the point in mentioning all this is just that like, those are very cultish examples <clears throat> of it, but like it ha- that kind of dynamic happens in a lot of uh, tightly Normal. bonded groups. Yeah. And, yeah. and like even just getting closer to people is often part of revealing information, right? That you don't reveal publicly. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think the notion, like this is self-serving for me, but like understanding ritual and religious psychology, it feels like it's an evergreen topic because it's it's remains relevant regardless of how important actual religions are in a society. The psychology is still uh, there and there's no society where rituals aren't like a big part of daily life. They're just yeah. n- not what people imagine um ritual to no. be yeah that's right like sports and so on so yeah it reminds me of the cultish discussion we had recently as well yeah it's just like, this, it's just like it's just degrees um but it's it's everywhere so getting back to the broader thing so let's let's talk about religion and mm-hmm. stuff generally right so so let me be let me Joe ask Rogan. obvious questions. <laughs> I'm going to be Joe Rogan. Like, what's it all about? What's yeah. it so, if you're you know, Joe Rogan, you just need to spin it to relate to COVID. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So religions like rituals are omnipresent. Yeah. Pretty they're, much. Yeah. Um, they're like a, a fixture uh, historically and cross-culturally. So... Why? But there's one, one, yeah, why? That's a good question. Why? But there's also one pin to put in it, which is that some people, uh, some scholars of religion, none, uh, no less, argue that that is not true. Religions are not cross-culturally consistent and they're not omnipresent, but rather they are a mo- product of modernity, in particular uh, Western um, or at least Abrahamic-focused concept that does not apply throughout history. So they, they're saying that the word religion conjures up images of institutions and priestly classes okay. and doctrines. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. That's not what I meant by religion. Yeah, no, no and so much, yeah, that's so, why yeah, they're that's wrong. Right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's a much broader definition which involves like dealing with supernatural agents and uh, powers in, and, and performing rituals and that which is the view that I take of it. So I won't deny that the English word religion and that the concepts that most people associate with religion are based around an Abrahamic frame, but, Mm. but there's much this interacting with invisible spirit entities and concerns with ritualized practices is ancient cross-culturally recurrent and doesn't require all of those things. You don't need institutions or princely classes to have it. So in that case, I think, uh, and a lot of anthropologists have argued that it is a uh, like human universal, cultural universal, yeah. rituals and religion. Um, so why, yeah. why yeah. is why? a good why? Yeah. So there's lots of explanations, right? There's tons. There's there's like terror management theory explanations, which I think are maybe largely debunked, but but it's yeah. still but still quite popular. The notion that like to deal with existential dread. We Mm. develop afterlife scenarios and so on. And then there's also functionalist takes about like the roles that institutions play in kind of gluing societies and communities together, right? Creating totems for groups to belong to. And that relates to the stuff that we've been talking about with costly signaling theories and, Mm. and so on and kind of evolutionary perspectives on why religion exists, which it probably is what are worth talking about. But I would also say that I think at a very base level, there's there's good arguments that the way that human minds and human cognition functions makes us likely to believe in invisible agents and to see 
uh, patterns of causality where there are none and to regard ritualized performances as uh, important ways to transmit like culture and information and so on. So there are all these like little parts of our cognition, which would incline us towards believing in invisible entities and supernatural uh, like causality. And these then I think bleed into the more evolutionarily group uh, kind of group, not group selection, but like cultural evolution uh, explanations about how religion and religious institutions in particular, the, there's a researcher called Dominic Johnson, and he argues that if you want to create like communities that can function in very large groups, right? This, this is like a thing with prisoner's dilemma. How do you maintain trust or, and cooperation with a non-kin, right? Which we see a lot in human non-cooperation mm. with non-related mm -hmm. people. And the answer is usually cultural institutions and early cultural institutions that can fulfill the role <clears throat> of uh, punishing people for non-cooperation, for immoral behavior, and say that you, even if you escape sanction in this life, you will receive ultimate sanction, our supernatural punishment systems. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? The idea of the punishment systems. Because like these days, modern people, we're, we're used to the idea of these codified abstract legal systems of laws and precedents and, and so on. But, you know, that's a pretty you know, ab both abstract and a pretty new innovation. Like before there was often that problem of, of legitimacy, you know, kings or, or leaders or whatever. And the, the supernatural and the religions provides a direct, like a, like yeah. a it's well, almost like two, the direct route to legitimacy, doesn't it? The two weren't separate, right? Like the mandate of heaven in China was, is like a supernatural concept, right? That the rulers who were supposed to be like that the cosmic order had determined where the people that should lead would be the ones who led. So if you, yeah. and if they didn't have the mandate of heaven, they could be removed by revolutions and so on. And, and vice versa with like the divine right of Kings. Of right? Kings. Yeah. So in Europe, so you, you, you have the intertwining of like supernatural legitimacy and uh, like, more secular but they weren't secular then but you know concepts of laws and and social contracts and that kind of thing yeah, so and just just social organization like yeah like re, like hierarchical like a rationale for this is why you're working in the field covered with shit and i'm riding around on a horse right it's not just it's not just luck you know yeah you're meant to be there i'm meant and to I, be here yeah i i think i don't know the details of them like uh that well but the Hammurabi codes, right? The these kind of ancient, like inscriptions that will set out a series of codes and laws. I would be surprised if they were, you know, entirely secular in nature and you know, but completely divorced from any concepts of, yeah, uh, yeah. like divine authorities and invested in Hammurabi or that kind of thing. So, and, and you do see, like in. In stuff like the Old Testament, you know, um, those sorts of scriptures, like the, it's full of rules and exhortations of what you should do and what you shouldn't do and who you need to respect and so on. And like a lot of it's kind of crazy or contradictory. But if there is a theme, then one of the themes is cooperate and be um, like play play your role in a cohesive. Uh, society that's kind of the that's kind of the theme you get if to be to be a good um, religious person but I, I like what you laid out there because you, you sort of laid out those three broad sort of theoretical explanations so you've got those that social bonding and cooperation stuff that we just talked about and, and before that you talked about the cognitive aspects which mm. I think are kind of interesting we could talk a little bit more because there's that these natural heuristics and biases and so on that we have in terms of seeking explanations for things causes mm. of things um and also the sort of you know but i, I think it's I, I i still despite the fact that terror management theory i think has been debunked i heard that too but i still have personally have a lot of sympathy for 
existential concerns. I think it's debunked in some of the stronger claims, but maybe the core idea that belief in an afterlife provides existential comfort, I think is hard to debunk entirely. And (laughs) or the notion that people will be punished eventually if they transgress, even if they don't seem to be in real life. Like there's an obvious psychological satisfaction in that idea that, you know, when we look around the world and we see Trump being the president and so on, right? Like that, it seems like exploiting and being the worst kind of person is often rewarded in society. But you want that, if that were the case, you know, that's not a good message to send to people. Um, So you prefer to have one where there is a universal system of justice that will take care of that, even if the human life doesn't. And even if you suffer tremendously in this life, but you are a good person, you mm-hmm. will be so it, like, in, this often is like why religion sometimes gets associated with uh, social conservatism, right? Because it's saying you don't, you don't need to worry about your condition so much in this life because, you know, do what you're supposed to do, follow your position in society and be a good whatever you are and you'll get your reward eventually you don't need to become a revolutionary right but but on the other hand religion has also served as a potent stimulus for various revolutionary groups or like uh social uh social justice movements throughout history right often have religious figures at the helm especially in the uh, modern period so yeah it's a it's a rich tapestry like uh, it is not just the opiate of the masses though no it has functioned as such in in many societies yeah i don't think any of those explanations are mutually exclusive i, I think I think no they they're not mm. and that, that's that's a general takeaway is like religion is such a complex phenomenon i have some sympathy for the people who want to say we shouldn't use the term religion it's too reductive and it suggests like too much of a cohesive whole but i i don't think you need that the in order to discuss the topic you can highlight there are all these different contexts where things perform differently there are all these different aspects supernatural beliefs ritual psychology like the you know the the branching division of within religious communities and and so on and so forth that you can look at individually as components but like having a broad category and a family resemblance type definition is fine with me. And it, it, like, it's the same as politics or any of these broad categories where there's lots of individual things you can talk about, but the, the general category does make sense to examine. Like if you talk about prehistoric politics, it, it makes sense, right? Even though it's, you're obviously not talking about multi-party democracies or that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as you we define our terms, then it's fine. You use something snappy like religion instead of using one of the definitions you pasted into the chat there, a system of beliefs and practice that revolves around commitments to supernatural anthropomorphic beings. <laughs> that, that, that's yeah. a bit of a mouthful. So, you know, These just, are, just, and that's, just that's the shortened version <laughs> the, yeah, of the, yeah. the yellow one. So, it, yeah. yeah. The, yeah. But I think so, that the... Uh, hmm. Go on. One thing that sometimes gets poo-pooed as not necessary, and I think it is important, is that like the distinguishing feature, because people sometimes say, well, there's nothing distinguishing. You can apply the definition to anything, right? But, but no, because to me, what distinguishes religion from other areas of life to some extent, right? The, it's always intertwined, like we talked about with politics and all that kind of stuff, but that is the supernatural element, the mm. appeal to I- invisible beings or forces that are the driving things. And then the ability to manipulate said forces by the correct beliefs or the right rituals. And that mm. though that is not inherent in every other aspect that one might, you know, associate with similar dynamics. So some people say, well, but you know, there are systems of religious belief that that have no gods and that is often sort of true like people made that came about buddhism but the words completely not true because buddhism 
has gods, not not even the Buddha and stuff. Well, what his status in mo- and in most Buddhist contexts, he's almost functioning as a god. But even when not presented as that, there is actually a realm of rebirth in traditional Buddhism, which is gods. So the there are gods in in Buddhism, but uh, but there are other systems which have a better claim, right? Animistic systems and so on. But in those mm. cases, you definitely still have supernatural uh, things things mm. which are invisible, which are, you know, that are not the same as like a, a boar running through the forest. And people sometimes take exception because they say, well, in those societies, they are treated as if they are, you know, physically there and just as real as a boar or an elephant. And But I, even then, I, I often find those claims unconvincing when you read the literature. It's like people believe they're real, but they... They don't treat them in exactly the same way they would, you know, just a wild animal that needs no. to be mollified or that kind of thing. No I, no, I don't see how that's different from a modern day evangelical saying that Christ is literally here with them and talking to them and him and so on. But, you know, I think I, I agree with you that I think that that supernatural element is, 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 is a necessary one and one that it distinguishes it from other kinds of belief systems because if you look at those those sort of theoretical explanations you mentioned before, like you can take those cognitive um, reasons, which it's like a shortcut to, to explaining why things happen is, is one way to sum of that up. But then again, you know, you can imagine various types of conspiracy theories and other sort of weird, weird, irrational or non-empirical beliefs that would still fit that. And if you can think about the social bonding, you can think about football clubs and stuff like that. There are exactly stuff that's, that's there's stuff that, but it's those existential concerns around death and the afterlife and meaning, you, you know, that, that sort of adds the extra, the extra spice that makes, makes religions a bit special. I'm not sure the afterlife component is the key, although it, it definitely is a recurrent feature, but I think the, uh, like, you know, understanding QAnon as a political cult makes more sense, right? Because it's, it's primarily focused around these kind of political actors and hidden forces. And they might be like given a level of power, which is supernatural, but they're not presented as, except, you know, so this is the difference between like, say when you start bringing in religious motifs about blood sucking demons or or you know alex jones style christian uh ethno-nationalism layered on top of the conspiracy worldview and there, you can have those overlaps but i think like kind of what you are suggesting when you're talking about the afterlife things is more that the motifs and the kind of figures and cosmological systems in religion are much more powerful because of the depth of symbolic meaning attached to them yeah. than something invented whole cloth. So even new age cults and what will usually mm. reference Jesus, Buddha, mm. uh, you know, they might even take Muhammad and, and so on, it, but they'll mix it in with other more modern things. Uh, but, well, but you still need those people. Well, here's an interesting example of that. I was listening recently to these people with these very strange extraterrestrial beliefs right so so you know it followed most of the tropes that people would be familiar with you know there's all these different alien civilizations and there's good ones and there's bad ones and there's like there was this whole elaborate baroque system that was the being... raptors the greys yeah, the that's, spider that's aliens right, the greys the spiders. <laughs> and there were these layers of it was you know layers of baroque craziness but it wasn't you could just tell that the way they spoke about it, it had these really strong religious overtones. Like I think these people were sort of simultaneously quite Christian and religious, as well as totally believing in the alien overlord thing. And I could just tell, I can't articulate it. You, you could probably explain it to me, but it, it felt to me like it, it it was an overlapping magisteria. You know? Yeah, it, it is. the same thing. And sometimes directly overlapping because the Elohim from biblical or I don't know, Abrahamic sources get like brought into that cosmology as actually being you know aliens <laughs> and and that yeah. they the, the, so you have you know a kind of stargate scenario where the the ancient religions are associated with like alien beings and 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 have 
overlaps there. So you have those crossovers. But I think the, you know, you, you see it also not just in like cults and, um, and those kind of, you know, UFO believers or so on. The interest in a, a detailed cosmology of, of different beings and factions and, and where and, and powers attributed to, to different individuals within this grand system, right? Cosmologies. That's something humans love and, and they love it in their fiction as just oh, as much as they love it in their dramas, right? People will build the Game of Thrones huge chart of all the relationships. And I think that comes from a combining like social primate love of interest and gossip and in human interaction with a bigger significance, right? And a more it like counterintuitive properties, which make it more interesting because your yeah. fundamental, it's the problem of science fiction, uh, a lot of science fiction that you have aliens, which are supposed to be alien and, you know, completely separate evolutionary lines. But the way they're written is fundamentally human. They're, they have yeah. the petty feuding and they're, you know, they're social primates that look like lizards or jellyfish. So yeah. it's, a, yeah, I yeah. think there's a lot of overlap and, and the cosmological systems in the pre-modern period, you have to yeah. also understand them in a world where there isn't mass media entertainment yeah, it is and stuff. Like, that's right, like the Greek pantheon or the, or the, um, the, the Norse pantheon uh, as entertainment, you know, stories, like, right? Like, Legends, a, like and when, myths. When, when, when there's no Netflix, it's a long evening. You have to fill that time. <laughs> well, it, most of humans were just telling in fields. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of that, but but when you come back from your your backbreaking labor, you you know you want to do something, so you got to hear a story. Yeah, yeah. Tell a story. Yeah, and there were well, always. Like, I, I, people Sorry. in society mm. who you know were good at that the yeah. so in some respect i mean this might be stretching things a bit far but like i think the gurus that we cover in a different time might very well have been the storytellers uh mm. the type yeah. who would you know be talking about the spirits and so on yeah there's a fine line between high priest and storyteller sometimes but i i like the thing that you hinted at which is that like people love the complexity. They, they love the intricate social relationships and the different powers and qualities that are attributed to the different actors and agents in these things. And that rang true for me because in, you know, one of the things I've studied, which is complementary and alternative medicines. And, you know, one of the interesting questions is why do people like them so much? Because they do like them. They're inherently appealing. And one of the reasons I, I genuinely believe is that most of them are just fascinating. Like they're just, they're just intrinsically interesting. Like just to take one example, like this color therapy thing, there's like hundreds of different colors. They all have different qualities. They can combine with each other in different ways. And, you know, homeopathy, um, energy therapies, you name it. They all have an absolutely fascinating kind of backstory. And, and yeah. for, for those who want to dig deep, it, it, it's for like uh, I've had a massage, for instance. Like, you know, like a, if someone is giving you a massage, that's nice, right? If someone's mm. giving you a massage and telling you that this pressure point is connected mm. to this thing and whatever, and that's why that's sore, whatever, it makes it feel better. It, yeah. It is, like even when you know it's bullshit, it having a story attached to it is yeah. really nice. It gives it a, a bigger significance, and it's it's always something that like when I'm in t teaching students about you know monotheism and uh, polytheism and the different systems that like when one thing that people don't appreciate so much is like even the monotheistic Abrahamic faiths, right? That are ostensibly about a God. You still have this pantheon, right? Of angels and saints and like, and, and beings who, if they're not gods, the way, you know, they, they can't, they don't have creator God status, but they still have a lot of powers out there mm -hmm. and they're, you know, and they're often battling bad versions who also have powers and stuff. So like in all our contexts, those are demigods and, uh, or, or they're feuding gods. And I like, I always liked Buddhism 
this is why, you know, the kind of atheistic presentation of Buddhism that is popular in the West is slightly grating because one of the historically recurrent features about Buddhism is that it's been very good at accommodating existing pantheons into its cosmology. So very often when it goes to somewhere, it didn't out, like ban the gods, right, that existed, you know, in a kind of Roman Greek thing, it took them. But I like that specifically in Japan, the, and there's something in Tibet as well with the Bon religion there, but they, they, because they have these anthropomorphic gods, right, in Japan, the Kami in the Shinto system, and they have shrines dedicated to them, that they, they built this theological justification that the Kami could study Buddhism and become like, you know, protector deities for Buddhism. So they, they built these temple shrine uh, buildings that were, which were shrines housed within temples where the Kami are then, you know, kind of learning Buddhism, becoming protected deities. And it, it's like, a, you know, it's a very physical manifestation of the ability of religions to do that, to like enter an area, provide a, a theological system that they say is better. And then to look at your existing gods and say, you know, those are nice. And we can we can do something with them, you know. <laughs> like yeah. that's, they, it's not a it, it's not a teardown, you know. We could we could renovate this, yeah. Yeah, and there are all the ways it can go, right? You can go that no, like fundamentalist movements that all that's got to go, that's impure. And I I much prefer the syncretic version, although you know people often have presented that as like debasing the religion because it's not, you know, pure. the it's not pure, but it's as a modus operandum it often leads to a lot less like burning of heretics so i'm generally in favor of it yeah we can all agree about that i think um so chris i'm conscious of your time i mean it's been... a, yeah we, <laughs> we slightly over our, our intended like uh bite-sized chunk um, but but still, you've been, you've been very generous. You've been very generous with the time. Um, we've helped yeah, you out. But no, I mean, I genuinely like I, I love this stuff. So the, probably if people if people found stuff interesting in this, they could let us know. And I'm sure you wouldn't wouldn't take much encouragement to follow no. up with any of those threads. Yeah. So you can ask about uh, if there's any uh, topics. Maybe you know. It, I don't know if people know our research areas that that well, but like that I. I've just explained what I'm interested in, like ritual and uh, religion. So you should now, Matt, before we finish, give people some idea of your areas of research interest so that if they have a, you know, a topic that they want to hear about, because the, the intention like this, this, this episode is quite obviously focused on my research, but we're not planning to make it always that way. We, we want to switch roles. So with yeah. what what but, are your uh, in a no, nutshell you know in a very no, no. oh no no, no. no. I, I won't do it now i won't do it now because i'll have my time in the sun oh okay yeah the we'll, next one we'll, will be your intro it will be thing, that's your right. people can stuff. ask me follow-up questions if they wish after that so okay that's okay that's don't right. worry don't worry it's fine. yeah it's fine i tried to be you know tone ticking equinanimous yeah. <laughs> 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 that's that's it um but yes so you the next time we do this we'll focus on matt's research and then after that we'll go into the hmm. the research sphere come on we need the name for actually, it like, well well actually the other thing we're going to do we talked about this before which i think would be really fun it would be like a a little mini journal club um because this you know occasionally we come across papers that are just that are just interesting and they're just a good they may not be right or whatever or hugely influential but they're just interesting and a good springboard to talk about good stuff so um i've got a couple of those in my back pocket so once we've um you know plumbed the depths of 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 our expertise which won't take long i'm sure we can get into <laughs> <I'm almost done>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we could get into yeah other people and um and that'll be really fun because yeah i'd like to yeah i think we'd like to talk to each other about them and um yeah maybe other people will be interested in hearing so that'd be great. yeah we can maybe uh you know send it to heller and brett to show them how to critically review a paper that like it is is possible how you do that that's 
that's just a dig, Matt. It's just a dig. It's a petty dig. But they, I mean, they claim to do that. And I've never seen them like properly critically review a paper. So we yeah. could actually do that. We could actually, so that's kind of a separate thing in a way, because I, I was just thinking of papers that are sort of fun and interesting to talk about. But there's kind of another thing we could do, which is take a, just take an empirical paper, for instance, and, and go through, yeah, you know, how, how, to, how to evaluate it. Yeah, critically. Yeah. yeah. And I, I will dry. say, it's a bit dry, but. No, it, it, it can make it fun. You can make it fun, just become extreme. That's the worst paper. <laughs> no, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, it depends on the paper. Like there's been one recently that has got academic psychology, Twitter in flame about, I don't know if you saw the, oh. the feeling cold, uh, uh, women, yeah, we, women wearing, who feel hot, like, like a dress physically you know, going out to a attractive. Club, clubbing, physically attractive, don't feel cold. That was or the, feel less cold. Yeah, it, feel there's, less cold. It, there's more to it, but there's a lot of debate about like the quality of that paper and so on. And maybe maybe we don't want to do that paper, but I just want to mean that there's, uh, you know, you, the, there are like papers which become interesting because for various social dynamics on Twitter, because they have features on them which are interesting to talk about. So we could do, you know, controversial papers and whatnot. Yep. Yeah. All good, all good things. Very good. Last thing, well, Matt. You, I enjoyed that. Yeah. Last thing, I just was mm. thinking, self-promotion. Um, I have an article at Eon, which I published a couple of years ago, and it's called Religion Without Belief. It's 3,300 words long. It's a long article, but it's. I think it's a nice condensed thing about my view about the importance of rituals and how people might attribute too much significance to belief sam harris <laughs> and <laughs> and so on so uh if, if people want to that's probably a non-academic summary of like some of my opinions about religion and ritual nice we'll put a link in the show notes very good all right so matt back to monday morning work and we will release the brené brown episode this week we promise we'll get to it. Yep. So yep. yeah, he's been busy. I've been sick, but it's going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen. All right. Ciao. Ciao.